Hello, everyone. Uh, we're here for a panel discussion at Show Studio to discuss flocking in humans and the synchronization of movements and the synchronization of societal movements. Um, for some reason, whether it is hard coded or if it's uh, through social pressures, um, we seem to synchronize our movements, whether for right or for wrong. Um, but why do we synchronize ourselves? What are the driving pressures behind that? And why are humans so fascinated with flocking? Why do we go and see big flocks of birds? Why do we find that interesting? Um, and we're here to discuss it with four interesting people. Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself. So my name is Serian Sumner, and I am a behavioral ecologist at University College London. I study social insects. Hello, I'm Sisi Liku. I'm a dance movement psychotherapist, psychotherapist and academic, and I'm here to contribute to this uh, panel the idea of creating groups for movement. I am Christos Papadopoulos. I'm a choreographer based in Athens. And at the moment, I'm doing uh, rehearsals for a new production that will be an Onassis Cultural Center production. And uh, I'm working with flocks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the right point. And I'm Lara johnson Wheeler. I'm features editor at Show Studio. And I'll be offering perhaps a fashion perspective. And uh, I'm Sebastian. Um, I am a technologist, but I also have a background in arts and culture and all sorts of interesting things. Um, so as Christoph said, we're mainly here to discuss movement, and he's just choreographed a, a new ballet about movement. Um, so I was hoping you could tell us, what is this ballet? Ballet, it's, uh, I don't know if it's the right word. It's, let's say it's a moving, uh, moving company somehow, because um, it's far away from any kind of uh, known, uh, known uh, dance form. So in a way, what I am interested in at the time being, it's I'm interested in synchronization and uh, what that means. It feels that uh, there is a tendency that we observe things that are synchronized or when they are about to be synchronized, there's a tendency that we there is uh, that we want to see the process till they mm. get synchronized. So all this process makes me think why we want to see it and mm. why we like at the moment that this is happening, we name it as a precious moment. Maybe it's just a matter of coincidence, mm. but the fact that uh, it might have a special meaning or we might give a special meaning, for me it's a precious, uh, a pr precious process. Mm. So in a way, in my, in my play, I'm trying to figure out what's happening between people in order to adjust and in the future to find a common ground in order to be synchronized. Mm. So it's a process dedicated to that. Not <coughs> to mind each other, but in a way to, to observe the process of adjusting in order to find this common step. So this uh, synchronization in mo motion, it's more about uh, the result of our common decision to go there than uh, making an artistic uh, choice to make something in tune. So more or less, that's what I'm I think I'm with. lucky in the sense that I've seen some of the piece that Christos is talking about. Spoilers. No spoilers, <laughs> but in fact, maybe a little spoiler. In, and I'm interested because in some of the motion, the dancers all move as one, but there are these elements in which they break away slightly mm -hmm. from each other. So I'm interested in that question really about when people do move people and animals, when organisms do move in groups, why there is that tendency as well to break away but return to a pack. So I wondered maybe what you thought about that concept. So movement in animals <coughs> is, is a whole field of research in its own right. Um, and so I guess the thing that I can bring to the table is how, um, how and why organisms might move in, uh, maybe not move, but function as a, as a cooperative group. Um, and so what we see in the social insects, so the bees, wasps and ants, where you have these phenomenal colonies with hundreds of thousands of individuals all functioning together in the same um, colony, um, they're all working for the same purpose. And they, we like to think of, a, of an insect colony as being a new level of individuality. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's what you're trying to achieve in your dance piece, such that um, you want the audience to not think about or observe um, individual people moving, but actually they're moving as a coherent 
new level, a higher level of individuality? I think I'm trying to do the opposite. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think I'm trying to, to achieve uh, by watching that uh, the, the output of, uh, or the outcome of uh, people moving together, it's, uh, in a way, it's the result of the choice of the individual. Mm -hmm. So I don't care to create a, like a spectacular flock on, on, on stage. I'm trying to make the audience meditate, actually, to make a, almost an optical illusion, mm -hmm. or to make this uh, continuous um, scenes that last forever mm -hmm. in order to understand and to see and to feel that what you are seeing right now it's uh, it's more about the individual okay. that make the choice to be there in yes. this specific moment mm -hmm. than uh, that this we take this for granted mm -hmm. that this is how things right. are happening mm -hmm. so in a way i'm trying to make people meditate in the way you look in the way you look and what you choose that right here, right now, is to be influenced. So that's really interesting because what you're talking about is the, is the early stages in the evolution of group living. Um, and so something like the honeybee, they are all functioning at that, individu that high level of individuality. All that matters is the queen mm -hmm. and that the workers help raise the queen's offspring. But one of the big questions in biology is how we get to that really incredible level of organisation. Mm -hmm. Um, and to do that, we need to study these simpler societies where every individual in that group has the option to leave it mm -hmm. or to remain. And understanding, it's quite, actually, it's quite easy. We understand a lot about why species like the honeybee function as they do. But what we don't understand very much about is why individuals will choose to be part of a group mm. when they don't need to be. Mm. So why should individuals within your dance choose to be part of the group and follow the flock and be synchronous when actually they don't have to. Yeah. I guess we need to, going back to Lara's initial question, how would we see it from different scientific mm. perspectives? There is um, a question that has to do with the development of the individual and the needs that need to be covered. So if we think the initial interactions with the carer, we have the mirroring, we have the kinesthetic mm. awareness that gradually develops and the kinesthetic empathy, again, gradually develops. And this is when we have psychopathology and we are in a society where it's so individualistic and we can't create groups and, and synchronize in groups. So in, in what Christus is saying and maybe connecting it also with the natural tendency to go together, but maybe there are some ruptures in the going together, we have the different developmental stages in, in the synchronizing. We start with the affiliation, usually like what we're doing now. We don't really know each other. We created a circle. That's the safe way to do it. Then we go into differentiation. I'm going to go to the toilet. Oh, I'm going to have a cup of tea. And then we go into the integration of creating shapes that we own. And then there is the separation at some point when we decide that we don't want to be in this group anymore. Um, and I think that the whole playing between group and individuals is, is fascinating in today's society. Yeah. So do we, do we know, is it all evolution behind this? Is it, are we from birth? Do we have the genetics to kind of seek out and make groups with people? Or are we coded to actually be individual and just it's the societal pressures that push us towards flocking? So, it's very difficult to put human social behaviour in the same mm. basket mm. as yeah. non-human social behaviour because there are very different pressures. Mm. A good example for social living, for example, in humans is we have to, in order for me to cooperate with you, I have to have some idea that there'll be some cooperation back. So reciprocation is really important. In a, because you're not, carrying, you're not sharing my genes, you're not going to help actually pass, uh, contribute to my, yeah. um, my fitness. Um, in in, in non-human animals, you normally get cooperation because it inc improves your fitness. In other words, fitness means your ability to pass on your genes. Mm -hmm. So um, flocking in starlings, for example, these murmurations that we don't actually really understand why they do it, but it's likely to be a case of the selfish herd, such that if you, if you stay in this big flock, you're less likely to be predated on. Mm. 
um, than if you were on your own. And that's, that comes down to a selfish interest. So I'm, I'm flocking because I know that by flocking, it will in, increase the chances that I can pass on more of my genes to the next generation by having offspring and surviving. It's quite different in human societies. So mm. it's very difficult to put the two in one basket. Mm. I'm thinking a bit about, you said this idea of survival and of predation because I think there's a concept, I'm thinking a bit about in fashion, the way that people move, move together and want to look the same. Mm -hmm. in order to identify with a certain group and often how that starts as wanting to you know, create an identity but really it is something that's quite protective it's something about you know, buying into something and creating an identity for yourself that um, ensures you're not alienated I wonder if, that is, if that's a similarity that you see um, so you're talking about building social bonds. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. So again, that's that. So that's sort of affiliative mm. behaviour that we see in the, um, not in the societies that have this very complex um, organisation mm. like the honeybee, but in things like mongooses or you know right. your cute meerkats that you see on TV. So they, it's a very simple they, behaviour. A lot of the behaviours that go on that in between individuals are affiliative. They're about building those social bonds. Mm. And the reason you need to build that social bond is that later on, if you're in danger, mm -hmm. you know that you've got some backup. Mm -hmm. And I think probably dance has got, I mean, you, you're the expert here, but it's, it, it, the evolution of dance in humans is, is partly to do with building those social bonds, right? Partially, but also uh, managing confrontation, managing conflict, managing the, the, the connection to the world. So if we can think but, and thinking about Christus' work, I'm thinking about the intrapersonal as the vertical line, and then we have the interpersonal trying to communicate with the other. So that's another reason why we, we want to create a group, we want to synchronize, to communicate. And then we also have the transpersonal with the word, with, with the, the more spiritual parts of where we are. And then again, why are we in, in a synchronizing situation? Maybe because we're trying to communicate on three different levels. And I don't mean it on the 3D idea of technology, <laughs> going back to you. Uh, so I was fascinated by um, the example you gave us earlier before we started the panel with the uh, flicking um, light. No, no, ah, of, of the, the cars. The real yes. inspiration. Yeah. The, real inspiration. the real inspiration, <laughs> yes. Because it's technology, but then we can see the symbolism of what is, try what, what is there communicated in something that it's so obvious, but then no one looks at it. In the psychotherapy world, so obviously you're trying to find some mental solace in physical motion, so you're trying to connect the motion to the the mental side of things. So is there, if you synchronize the movement, is there some kind of peace that comes with that? Or is there, can you synchronize thoughts in the same way? I think you're going into the mind-body connection and the whole Cartesian so, yeah. idea. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I guess that the synchronizing when it comes to group therapy and group dance movement psychotherapy, and in today's society, again, and I highlight it because obviously there is the evolution in, in what psychotherapy is trying to, to achieve too, and has to do with the loneliness that comes in, in our society. And group therapy, uh, unfortunately, uh, hasn't had the same, um, it's, it's not in the, the same trendy idea as it used to be in the 60s where we had the more collective spirit. So the whole idea of synchronizing has started really fading away in our society mm -hmm. and maybe that's a vital need that is missing, an embodied need that is missing. Yeah, it's funny, we seem to synchronize our movements happily and our, our trends, mm -hmm. um, but maybe not our thoughts. For some reason we're not synchronizing our thoughts just yet. Well, well I think it's, it's all about the power and the numbers though. So there's this really nice study where they, um, uh, on a busy street, that you might know this study where they sent out um, one person and got them to stand on the street and look up, mm. and everybody's just walking by. Yeah. And then they send five people out, and they all stand on the street looking yeah. up, and everybody continues walking by. And then they send 15 people out to look up, and then suddenly everybody starts looking up. So it's the kind of vigilance behaviour, uh, but you need a critical mass before you can get that group behaviour. Yes. So I don't know how that relates to kind of the loneliness of, mm. of, yeah. of society and our, our world in society and that we need a kind of critical mass of something to make that group behaviour emerge. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think 
thinking about the way that loneliness perhaps is a concept, I think that the way that people then decide to move in groups in fashion is also definitely a part of expression. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the dance piece and thinking about how obviously that, you know, dance and art, all art forms are used as a form of expression. It seems to me that to dress in a certain way, to, to wake up and to choose a certain form of dressing and appearance is a form of expressing yourself in a, maybe a way to avoid a sense of loneliness and segregation and a way to open to other parts of society and to open that. So that's forming a sense of identity. Well, exactly. And trying to match your identity with those of the people around you. Yeah, so I think so. I think so. And then, bonds. you know, yeah. perhaps further than that, perhaps it's something that's not necessarily intended at the time. And I think that a lot of people, you know, fashion and arts, it's about creating something that's individual. But it has to be, it can't help. I think a lot of people it can't help but become part of a group. And I think that's something that's very different in terms of the animal world, as far as I'm aware. It's not necessarily a desire to be an individual, whereas there is... Well, there is a desire to pass on your individuality, mm. which are your genes. Mm. So, yes, yeah, so it is very much about the individual, just in a slightly different sense. So but only in terms one, of mating? Or? Well, yeah, well, survival. Yeah. If you don't survive, you yeah. don't get to mate, you don't get to yeah. pass on your genes. And maybe it's the same with, you know, mm. maybe if you don't wear the right thing amongst well, I the think right so. circle, it's a form you of don't survive. Then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, you know, yes, yeah, so there is the whole point mm. of getting a mate, but mm. even within, you know, when you're, when you're in situations where you're not looking for a mate, maybe your choice of mm. fashion mm. Um, is kind of... Um, it's important that you are mirroring what those around you are, well, I think, to a certain extent. I think there's, this, there's an idea of mirroring, but also a concept that's so important in fashion is desire, obviously. And when a designer is designing, they want to be creating something that their consumer is going to want in six months. And so I think there's very much that need, as well as you know, someone puts a garment on and wants to be desirable in that, it, very, the concept of desire is inherent in what's mm -hmm. being done there. I think it's, you know, in, the, in, in painting, someone's creating something because there's a desire in them to create. But there's that external thing when someone's creating a garment that they're thinking about someone who will want that. Do, do you feel that there might be, though, something in, in, as if it's a non-verbal statement yeah. for belonging and similarly trying to connect mm. the two uh, uh, oh, disciplines yeah, you bring here in the panel? The non-verbal statement of clothes and non-verbal statement of well, dance. I think that's definitely what I'm trying to say here. And then I think that that's something that I picked up on as well when I was watching yeah. the piece, is how much was being said in that dance. But obviously... Well, was there anything being said? I don't know. What's the meaning of it? Is there a meaning? Because I know that, you know, a movement in an animal situation has to have a meaning. It's got a function. It's been selected for by natural selection from the evolutionary process. But dance, does it, have, does it have to have a meaning? Or does it have multiple meanings? It has multiple meanings. Yeah. It has multiple meanings for the dancer and for the spectator. Because in a way, when you, first of all, you create a moving form, like a moving state. Within this state, that's also, for my work, it's influenced from nature, from patterns. It's like that you're creating, I'm working a lot with repetition. Mm. So you're trying to perceive, and I'm trying to work on repetition, not like uh, we're watching a metronome, like seeing the same thing again and again. It's more about creating the state and the space within this small fragment of movement that the person can constantly evolve, ev evolve and uh, go on and make choices. So in a way, wh what I want to say is that uh, being synchronized doesn't mean for me saying yes. Mm -hmm. It's like we, we perceive this uh, uh, syn being synchronized an, as an uh, absolute size. Being synchronized is about uh, also debating and uh, coming to a conclusion. But before the conclusion, it can be like yes and no, yes and no, yes and no. And actually this is what's happening also in, in the animals. Mm. Like in the flocks, they're saying yes and no all the time in order to achieve uh, to avoid the predator at the end. So also for our social life, or also for my dance uh, uh, fantasy, it's a process. 
being synchronized, it's a process of yes and no. Mm -hmm. So the agreeing and disagreeing, it's a part of the game and it's a result of uh, the personal uh, path that everybody follows. Mm -hmm. So in a way, yes, there is a task. There is a task to coexist, in a way. So to what extent is your piece governed by rules that you impose versus... 100%. Mm -hmm. It's all I'm your... a dictator. Okay. okay. <laughs> Feels very controlled. But is there a formula? No, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a dictator with the limitations. So it's so many limitations, like right. forever, poor dancers. <laughs> and within these limitations that you need to move in, like for two months in this volume, mm. you need to find your own truth and your own sincerity with what we're aiming for and how you perceive the person next to you and how you perceive the task in front of you, the world in front of you. So in a way, it's, it's, a, it's a way to go very deep inside your body to find the right uh, imagination in order to be very extrovert because it is, I'm trying to make a very extrovert uh, system mm. in a way, so yours is, like the flocking. It's almost multiple. So the audience that comes to see it, they're seeing one flock but also the dancers are also partaking in their, their own little flock. And I guess each time it's different yeah, yeah, yeah. and the it rules. Do you is. have some examples of the, the formula that you, because I guess you can't, you can't dictate the exact dance. You just give them kind of rules and they interpret it each yeah. time or, yeah. wow. So they make their own flock. Oh, okay. Yeah, because for example, to make it a little bit more real, mm. what we, for example, you have one motion, one, uh, ac let's say that you have one uh, action, I want to take the glass. But the, the way that our mind works, till I get the glass, I, I might have like thousands of thoughts. I might think, maybe it's his. Can I take it? Is it rude? They're filming me. I'm, is it right to drink now? So there is a debate till you get to do it. So in a way, in my world, I'm trying to make uh, that the end is not more strong than the process. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to bring life in the process. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to see that we might do the same thing, that we all take the glass, but our personal path till at the end, after 60 minutes of a performance, we take the glass, it's a really different process. So every time you see each dancer, you should be very sure or what, of what you're say, mm -hmm. seeing. If it's a yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, until you finally get it. So it's always a debate with motion and pattern itself. And how many times have you seen the dance? Like how many in rehearsals? Hundreds or thousands? <laughs> and every time it's different. It's different. Yeah. I mean, it's not different in the in the essence that uh, they get the they, glass. They get the glass. We, take, yeah. we speak, mm -hmm. but every time it's very very different. So in, what, uh, the can process. you give me an example of the actual rules that you give the dancers? Or is it like, only, you know, be this close to the next person or I mean, what, what are the rules? First of all, uh, they don't look at each other, never. Okay. They always look in front, like the birds, let's say. So they, in a way, af after a lot of work, they, in a way, they develop a commune, a, a commune sense mm. of space. Yeah. What is without space? Vision, without, without using vision. vision. It's almost like they get rid of that sense. Yeah, they only yeah. look in front. So yeah. in a way, the, their antennas, they get more sensitive mm, yeah. because they need to embrace the rest of them without really looking mm, okay. in order to find their goal and okay. communicate with us outside. So every, every, for example, we are doing a big training. What does it mean to be like this and like this? It's a different relation and we need to be very aware of this new relation. Or if I'm like here, mm. even for you, we have a different relation. Yeah. And now we have a different relation. And now we have a totally different relation. <laughs> so in a way, space, like every centimeter of space, it's really precious mm. in order to understand what we communicate and what we feel for each other. It's a different dynamic, isn't it? I mean, like what you just demonstrated, the dynamic between you and Lara was so different. Yes, and then similarly, the lines we had from this perspective, and then Seb mm. was almost excluded. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's real. Yeah. Like the dynamic yeah. is uh, not it as It changes creation. our behavior. It changes yeah. our behavior. It's really, yeah. The movement changes she, the behavior. She felt something each. different, and I felt something different. <laughs> she smiled. Mm. I did. I smiled. <laughs> so it's, it's a micro, micro resets and micro movement and micro huge. Mm. Uh, 
Okay, so, so I understand that, but I still don't understand. So the only rule that you've given us so far is that they have to look ahead. Yeah. Right, okay. So then what are the rules regarding proximity? Um, or maybe there are none. There are times when they're very close together, but it's quite extraordinary. For example, we have one rule. They move sort of in synchronisation, but it never feels like they're copying. It feels no. very much like a natural motion. Like there, they're there aware that there like should be the technical parts. For example, if I see you moving, I can be influenced. Mm. But then you can create more and more limitations the way that I am influenced. Am I copying? Am I, tr am I copying mo uh, the motion itself? Am I copying the, the rhythm itself? Am I copying everything? Or I'm trying to understand what you are telling mm. and I'm telling my story. And this is very obvious. If you're working with your skin, like if you're working with your motion, or you are working with imagination that the other person is provoking. Responding rather than coping, in other words. Yeah? Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And then you create more limitations that uh, your interpretation of what the other person is doing, it might be a yes mm -hmm. for the audience or it might be a no. Mm -hmm. And you always need to be very sincere and uh, direct with your yes and the no. Yeah. I mean, it sounds very... Uh, well, I, what I'm getting at, so a, a, a big um, thing, a, a, a big field of research in particularly in group living animals yeah. like social insects is um, we can come up with these rules, mm -hmm. which, so ants foraging paths, mm -hmm. for example. Um, there are studies that have defined the specific rules mm -hmm. on how you go when an ant leaves its nest, how it's going to get to its forage and how it's going to get back. And the rules involve, uh, are influenced by other ants around it, mm. but also the sun and land, mm. landmarks. And um, if you change those parameters, mm. then um, the rules still exist, but, they, because, but the organism will adjust mm. um, according to that rule. So I was just wondering whether, if you had a really clear um, you know, list of rules, quantitative rules, we could program it and we could see Oof, if I've, computer I've started programs. reacting to this as a non-scientific, <laughs> like, oh. Get up and do the dance right now, <laughs> if we had the rules. But we could get a computer to do it, which would be much less embarrassing. <laughs> um, and see if the computer produces the same kind of flow that your dancers produce. Probably not, because your dancers will be imperfect. And they're and humans. The computer programs will mm. be much more yeah. um, perfect to the rules, but possibly not getting at those nuances and which are with the same rules, it will be exactly the same in the, in the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, there will be your rules. So whatever the rules are in your precise choreography, um, we'd get the computer to replicate Yes, that. but the rules are always uh, leaving space for the individual mm -hmm. choice. See, that's, right that's, here, that's right noise. Now. That's the flaw. That's the noise. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, and that's so the annoying thing. Up, yeah. well, you, could give, you could give those kind of, you know, yeah, the noise parameters. <laughs> So I've it's, just, you know. it's interesting that you bring up this idea of creating rules and ideas. I was talk having a conversation yesterday, in fact, about why certain cultural movements come about and whether you could replicate cultural movements in society, you know, fashion movements like punk, for example. Mm. If you create, if you were able to employ the same sort of cultural climate, so the political climate was the same, you know, music was coming up in the same way, and just chose a few key people and sort of place them yeah. in a vacuum, whether you'd be able to create that spark that people decided was so interesting. Yeah, so that's cultural evolution. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's so. the bit that fascinates me the most is it's the impetus, right? Mm. So for example, with your dance troupe, you know, are you ever tempted to play God and you know, they're in the middle of their performance and you just kind of like get another dancer and throw them onto the stage, you know, mm. and see, you know, because that's... Yeah. <laughs> Horror in his face. <laughs> I think Jesus has already said so much about his power and that uh, he, he admits his power, but at the sure. same time he doesn't abuse his power. Sure. So I'm, I'm bringing the, the, the whole thing. It's interesting because for me, the dynamic that is created here, how we conformed at the beginning of doing what we were told to do, present ourselves, start talking, giving space to each other. Now we've started rebelling a little bit. <laughs> so the synchrony is not there anymore. Mm. Um, uh, and it's fascinating because we, have, we come from so many different perspectives of one thing that obviously has been in our um, awareness for our work, whichever work we do. Um, but it fascinates me, this whole power struggle, as soon as we go into the, we know each other a little bit, let's take the rebel's role. 
five different individuals, and then what happens to synchronizing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the synchrony here is that we're all fascinated by the same mm. big, yeah. big yeah. issue. The big. It's, we're still synchronized. Yeah. Yes. Well, but I mean, it's really we're in a survival thing here because you know we all care about our reputations. <laughs> 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 but you know, and so this is. I mean, do we see this in animals at all? Where you have a flock of monkeys or whatever, yeah. a gathering of monkeys, whatever the collective noun is. Um, I should have known that word. And, <laughs> but do they occasionally, does a guy strike out and go and make another camp somewhere and pray that people follow him, like a trend? Well, I mean, yeah, reputation is really important in, in these cooperative societies. Mm. So not so much in your complex social insect societies, but in your, you know, your, your um, cooperatively breeding um, mammals and also birds. Um, and so your re reputation, the same, it, it functions in the same way as it does in human society. So if I treat you badly or if I'm really rude, you actually won't invite me onto another panel. Um, and uh, whereas actually if I do a good job, then you might well do. And so my reputation on how I perform, on how I behave, has implications for the future um, treatment of me by the group. And that's exactly the same in a, in a cooperative um, animal society. Um, yeah, so if you are, if you are, um, a re so your example of whether if one individual goes off and says, right, you guys need to come with me, whether they follow will all depend on the status of that individual mm -hmm. in that group. And within these cooperative societies, you have a very strict hierarchy normally with the top dog or monkey. <laughs> and then you'll have, um, so, you know, we often recur we refer to them as the alpha and the beta and so on. And, 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 and they are vying. There's constant competition vying between them, often physical, to retain and maintain that, their position in the hierarchy. Um, and such that if, if it were the top dog who said, right, we're going to go over there, mm. go to a new foraging patch, the, the group would follow. Whereas if it was um, one of the, the bottom subordinates, they'd just ignore it. And actually the survival of you as a crop to, uh, with your survival depends on your group. Mm. And mm. so you won't risk that. So are humans somewhat, I mean, obviously we have lots of things that don't apply to humans in various ways, but with trends, for mm. example, they are humans lucky enough that they can just strike off, do their thing, and because our lives are fairly cushy, we're not worried about you know, well, I dying. think that sounds totally relatable, you're saying the idea that actually so much of it's to do with status. And I think in terms of if someone wants to rebel in that sense in fashion, it's very much to do with status too. Clearly it's very much more animalistic than I really thought. But there's yeah. also a critical mass though, isn't it? Mm. So for example, some of the underground movements, mm. you know, they bubble mm. around for 10 years mm. and then, you know, not purely, it's not through reputation at all in that case, it's just they finally, you know, they're big enough that people start to look, like the 15 people looking up outside. Yeah, you know, yeah. but um, I think that's also that thing where uh, something like that will, comes together based on all of the, um, ev all of the elements that come into place and the spark will happen and so a cultural movement becomes relevant or into the consciousness of the general public because of, a, I don't know, a tiny thing that's happened that's made it relevant. And I think we wanted to perhaps talk a bit about the way that the digital has affected how that happens. And I think in terms of the way that people are able to share information, so, you know, fashion and the way that people consume imagery has become so much broader. But it's also become a lot more, um, there is this problem that you're already, always you exist in a bubble mm. on your social media or your followers yeah. or your friends are people who share that mm. interest with you mm. and if they don't like what they hear or see mm. you do they'll probably leave your group and so it's self uh, reinforcing and, and I think that's probably one of the reasons not to get too political but no. that, that you know Brexit happened mm. um, because everybody exists in their own little bubble and they are, you know they, they, they talk about their issues within their own social um, network, their digital social network, and everyone in their social network is reinforcing mm. their ideas. So they think, oh, it's definitely the right decision, mm. definitely the right decision. And because they're not actually reaching out, mm. um, they, the, the ideas can, can grow without any knowledge of what's going on in the outside world. That must be what happens with fashion, right? Well, I think the idea is, yeah, so this concept of a digital vacuum is obviously very aware and I think the thing is with fashion is it's such an insular community anyway that yes but on the other hand people are so interested in social media platforms and joining those that I think maybe conversely it's able to have a reach that it wasn't really able to have before and whilst yes a lot of people communicate via those bubble communities 
you are able to share images. It's likely that someone will see, someone who doesn't follow fashion, who doesn't follow that kind of thing, will see something that will pique interest on Twitter or so. So I think there's, there's a toss up in the way that those kinds of communities. And that's, a, I mean, what you're talking about there is um, within a social networks, mm. and there's a mm. huge field of science about mm. social networks, mm. so there's the importance of those weak links. Mm. So all you need potentially is, is one, one link exactly. to another group. Something that filters then, out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you get the sort of the perpetuation of the, and the evolution yeah. of that. That, that, um, that, that then inspires well. growth and then yeah. as sort of flipping back around and then a movement can begin. Do we see an acceleration of I mean, my interest in the internet is that mm. things seem to happen quicker now. Like in the olden days, oh, yeah. things would take a long time. And the internet allows people, you know, in very different places geographically to form a flock, for want of a better word. You know, they make a forum or they make a Twitter group or something like that. And I guess that also affects fashion. Mm. I assume trends. Well, I think, yeah, the pace of, anyone will take the pace of fashion has picked up um, almost excruciatingly. But um, I think that people, because there's such a consciousness to want to create something new constantly, and if you see an image, a, des a designer has created an, a, a garment, a look, and you see that image and you want to covet it, and then there's the constant desire to keep creating and to keep churning out more and more and more. So I think that, you know, so yes, I think that the way that, the dig that digital image sharing works now currently is that it has increased the pace of fashion extraordinarily, the way that people want to consume, people want to buy, and that there's a pressure to keep creating. Doesn't it also, the whole digital world gives a, a voice to the individual. So oh, yeah. you might, you know, previously, 40, 30, 40 years ago, you'd have to be part of a, you know, a proper fashion house or whatever to get your product um, aired. Whereas these days, an individual, yeah. you know, like Pinterest. Or yeah, well, this is Etsy something that's so interesting for young designers. <laughs> if young designers, are able to kind of curate their social media following in a way that piques interest of lots of people. They're able to actually become something that is spoken about without necessarily the financial backing that previously would have been needed, and, and that's able to come. So there is, you know, in a lot of ways, social media is a real gift mm -hmm. for a lot of for young and up-and-coming designers. However, it can also be a downfall. That can also be sort of this illusion that if you have lots of popularity and lots of following and people seem to be liking a lot of what you do, it may not be sustainable. Okay. I mean, from a psychotherapy point of view, I guess the speed at which people flock and move, I assume, has... A massive impact. Yes. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, actually, um, um, that it's fascinating that we talk about the speed of, of the internet, the speed of social media, and then at the same time we have the idealization of meditation, mindfulness, yoga, everything that has to do with coming back to a slower rhythm. And then I was reading your blurb in Greek uh, on the website uh, where you have something about the quiet moments, if, if I remember the expression, something about quiet or slow, and how there, nowadays we idealize anything that is slow or quiet yeah. because we've, we've reached the peak point of having no more capacity for um, fast rhythm. Um, I mean, for, for me, uh, as a therapist, when I see clients rushing to their session because they had to speak on the phone and they just come with a phone in the session, this is a rule that I put. That's, a, that's your sacred moment. You just have to stop bringing the phone whilst I'm opening the door for you. And that's the only rule. So I'm a dictator sometimes, too. <laughs> I have to say that it's, it's something about not going to the extremes and whether we can actually find a rhythm that suits us rather than the imposed rhythm of, of um, culture, mm. society, um, and the whole world. Yes. For example, uh, sorry. sorry. No, no. Okay. Now, what I what experience about rhythm in my process uh, it's uh, it's amazing how how greedy you can how you can become immediately. For example, I'm creating something, and then I always have the tendency, or like I, because I'm always try to be very slow and very like step by step everything, and then I say, ah, oh, let's try to make this, and then yes. I, I I make something more, a bit more clever, or a bit more uh, like uh, edited or uh, composed. And then uh, I see that and I want more. 
and then I want more, and then I realize that I'm in the wrong track because one brings another. So I need to go erase everything and then start seeing everything. And I, I really experience every time how greedy I become. Mm. I give me something and I, then I want more. And how it's really a, like an avalanche. How do you experience it on an embodied level? Because you, you talked about being greedy and then I started having images and I was just... I'm like, just watching and saying, now what? Yeah. This, this, uh, this phrase in my mind means that I'm greedy that I saw yeah. it and I want more. Now, it's not just ambition. No, uh, but I'm watching it as a spectator, not mm. as a maker. Okay. So then I see that I, the composition starts rising and then I want to see more and more. And if you see more, then you cannot go back to nothingness or to slow. You need, yeah. to, yeah. you need to enforce your choice of creating. So you need to erase everything and say, okay. And then the nice state of mind is by saying, I can see it forever, yes. And then go with the flow in a way. So what are the dynamics of the piece in terms of the movement? Do, they, do, do, do you have those quiet moments, they're slow and then faster? And yes, oh. but uh, the range is very small. Oh, okay. It's like, uh, also it's like uh, in a way teaching the audience the, the code. For example, if, if I do this, and then you, you, you see that this is the limitation of the movement and all of a sudden you're like, it's a huge, it's a huge uh, step. Mm -hmm. So in a way, small and big, it's, uh, you teach yourself and the audience and the dancers that this can be big and this can be small. Mm -hmm. So the, it's not about big and small, it's about mm -hmm. shifting and uh, yeah. The, the pressure you said you felt to always improve, to always do more. Do you feel that is because you're part of this larger flock of people that are watching you that are interested in, or is it a very personal, internal? I think it's, uh, it's the biggest enemy that, uh, that uh, I have as a, as a creator. Mm. Because if I'm true with myself, then uh, I'm always like uh, very slow in order to understand and feel and guide it. But of course, you get in the, the temptation to, to to make a performance, mm. and then you lose the game. You really lose the game. So do you think if you went and sat in a, 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 a shed in the countryside in Greece, would all that go away and you would be back to the, the slow, calm Christos? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess. That's why I always go back to nature, yeah. where my inspiration is from yeah. there. It seems like a lot of, I, I like classical music, um, and a lot of classical composers, they go and put themselves in a shed in the middle of nowhere um, because they want to escape that. It's really the odd. Pressure. I have yeah. the total yeah. opposite. I, so if I go to the, to, I'm a field biologist, and if I go to the field, that's what starts me. I, I see the animals interacting and doing their thing, and that's when I get my ideas. Mm. So it's almost, I almost get overloads mm. of, oh, this is amazing. Oh, what are they do why are they doing that? What are they doing? What, what's happening here? Oh, I want to do this. So it's almost, you know, nature is not relaxing for me. It's too stimulating. Probably the same, <laughs> but still, but, uh, at the end, very end, it's uh, relaxing. Yeah. When I go back, I say, oh, wow. Right. You don't have the social okay. pressure mm -hmm. of performing in relationships mm -hmm. or in groups. Yeah. And so do we ultimately, do we have a choice whether we want to synchronize or not? Like, I know animals, in the animal kingdom, they probably don't have a whole lot of choice whether they want to synchronize or not. No. Um, do humans ultimately have any choice or do we just have to go with it? I might push you off if I say, yes, we do have the choice. If we do a little bit of work in the, in the conditioning, we, we've all been brought up with the conditioning of belonging to a group, and whether we have the choice of which group we want to belong, uh, and the, the whole peer pressure too. So if, if you do belong to a group, then, psychologically speaking, then you, you go with, with the rules of the group, and then sometimes it's very hard to go back into the vertical line because you're constantly into the horizontal line of, of uh, matching with what the group is asking you to do. Uh, but I think the whole point of trying to find oneself and investing in oneself uh, has to do with trying to find some personal meaning uh, as well as belonging to the collective. That the one doesn't delete the other. I see. You 
Yeah, so, um, so I was constantly, you know, I was thinking, uh, so in behavioural ecology, we always ask, if you want to understand a behaviour and synchrony of humans in whatever context is a behaviour, um, we always ask four questions, and these were four questions that were defined by the kind of the godfather of behavioural ecology in the 1960s, Tim, uh, Nico Tinbergen. And he, he um, explained that there's four questions you need to ask of the same behaviour in order to truly understand that behaviour, the how and the why, you know, why it exists and how it exists. And they are, so there's two how questions. So what's the mechanism, which I guess would be the, f the physiology of your dancers learning to do this tiny movement. You know, that must be technically quite challenging. Very much. Yeah, and maybe mentally as well as physically. Yeah, so that would be the mechanism. So, you know, can we ask of your dance and your dancers, what are the mechanisms by which your dance emerges? And the second question we can ask, which is what, made you, what you said made me think of this, is uh, the second question is about the ontogeny or the development that influences the outcome. And, and that, I think you mentioned earlier on about um, your environment in which you grow up in, how much you um, interact with mm -hmm. other people. So, and the mirroring thing, you know, your children mimic their parents. Um, depending on your environment, that will influence how you behave and how you, potentially how you dance. I think there is research showing that, well, culturally, you know, depending on which kind of culture, that's your environment in which you grow up in, you'll dance in a different way, you'll move, you'll, you'll use your body in a different way. Um, so that's the two questions of, about how you get that behaviour. And then there's two questions about why. And, and the why is the thing that I think is really exciting and really interesting because it asks about why it exists. So maybe it's not actually that relevant to humans. I think that's mm. the real divide between yes. human dance and animal dance and animal movement because the why is what's the function. And function in biology, non-human biology, always comes down to passing on your genes. So how does it increase your, fit, your fitness, your evolutionary fitness? Um, so I'm not quite sure what the answer would be for, for this, but may, you know, there must be a, there's a, that's why I think it comes down to the question of what's the meaning of your dance? And I think that's an unanswerable question, perhaps. And then the fourth question, before we get onto that, <laughs> is about the evolution and the evolutionary history. And the reason why, why synchrony exists, and it's often to do with, you have to look back at your ancestral roots. Um, and so many birds show flocking behaviour, and that's not because they all evolved it independently, it's probably because their ancestors, their common ancestor, would have uh, evolved that flocking behaviour and that would have had a fitness for, uh, benefit. So why do, we, why do we move in synchrony? Why do we dance? The evolution of dance in human societies, I, I don't know much about it, but I mean, you know, it has evolved independently in, in human societies all over the world. Um, thousands of years ago, and I think that's fascinating. So I think dance, the reasons why humans dance and why we move in synchrony to particular sounds, particular motions, um, is, is a product of evolution, and I think it's a fascinating idea. It's fascinating. Yeah. What it creates, what's the feedback of the rhythm and the dance itself, like uh, also like in the rituals, it, it creates something, it has an impact. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's like fooling each other, or fooling ourselves, like I do this in order that this mm. will give me back some uh, information or some collective uh, awareness that I cannot achieve without, and this is amazing. So it's a, communi it's a mode of communication and expression that goes beyond mm. the word or... The like as I was watching this documentary of Northern Greece, there is uh, this uh, small village that uh, they have these rituals of uh, stepping on fire, on uh, like... Cold. Uh, yeah. Mm. And uh, the documentary was, uh, you could see all the process uh, like of this uh, almost incredible thing, how can we do it? And they were watching all these old ladies, like uh, 80 years old, start dancing for, for example, for a Christian uh, saint, uh, name, day, whatever. But the, this, is just a, this is just a reason to do it, like a, not, no reason actually. So they start uh, dancing like 24 hours before in their houses. So they create these rituals and they rip with a repetition and they keep on dancing and dancing and then they lose this, uh, they go in this ecstasy, whatever, mm. I don't know what is it. And they, they, they are able to, op they open the door, they go out and they, they do it. And it's like, why this is possible right now? Why, what's the boundaries that you just break in yourself and what is right or wrong or what is possible, not possible through the rhythm or through the dancing?
Was it only women that were dancing, by the way? No, or? no. Because oh. I was interested about the, no, no, no. <laughs> the suffocation yeah. in terms of the, the metaphoric suffocation of the freedom to express yeah. mind, body. So, so we do, do we think that humans can avoid synchronization? Can they, you know, could a human go and live in a shed in the middle of nowhere and be happy? Or do they need to be part of some kind of synchronization? I think it all depends on the stage and development. So the studies that show that children who are sadly being brought up in isolation can't function in a group mm. or when they're adults. Mm. Um, so I think there's this critical period in development in any organism, it's not just humans, mm. but worms, anything, flies, um, during development, during those early early stages of development, whereby if you don't, if you're not exposed to what is a normal environment, so a normal social environment with normal social interactions, then that affects how you, how your ability to become that synchronous yeah. unit, I guess. But perhaps you can. I agree with this, and I, I would like to add the whole concept of kinesthetic empathy, that even if you are not with other humans, even if you're in nature and let's say you've you've been abandoned in, in the middle of nowhere as a child, there is this innate tendency to empathize kinesthetically with a movement that is in front of you. So maybe a task is mm. to just uh, look at the leaf that is about to, lead to, to fall from a tree and you look at this leaf going like this for about five minutes, absent-minded, and then you start moving without realizing that you empathically move with the leaf. So maybe synchronizing happens without really consciously attempting to synchronize with think, human or non-human. Yeah, but with people want to synchronize in a lot of ways, I think, in, in, in terms of the way that people have evolved and so that the human mind is elevated in the sense that these animal behaviors are to do with survival. Humans use synchronization and flocking as an expression of art, as an expression of something that's perhaps more elevated than simply surviving but it could still be survival because if you're not forming if you're not synchronizing you're not forming that social mm. bond mm. you're not empathizing with mm. your group yeah. and therefore you you know it's all about reputation again side, yeah. unless you've known to conform and do as the group yeah. does mm. you won't be supported in times of trouble mm. and that can have fitness you know fitness consequences in genetic terms the, the emotional survival so even if you are on your own in the middle of nowhere there is, there is a need there, there's a need for connection. So even if you connect with other than human, with another than human, then still there is something about the fulfillment of a need and survival. It sounds like this is a huge topic and we've yes. only touched on a bit of it, but I think we all agree that, you know, that synchrony in some kind, whether it's with other humans or with nature, is very important. Yeah. And I think that's a good place to end the panel, I think. So thank you guys.